Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jonathan Mavertis. I'm with the Richard Nixon Foundation. Welcome to the Richard Nixon Presidential Library. Before we introduce our distinguished speaker uh, this evening, I just wanted to um, just mention a couple of special guests. We have the, our distinguished speaker's uh, daughter here, Lisa Lord, and her husband, Jack Wilde. And we have Betsy Hewitt, the wife of our president and CEO, newly elected Hugh Hewitt. To introduce our distinguished speaker, our distinguished speaker was to Dr. Kissinger as Dr. Kissinger was to President Nixon. He joined Kissinger's national security staff in 1969 as special assistant working and traveling the world on virtually every major diplomatic initiative of the administration in the midst of the Vietnam War and the greater Cold War. He was with Dr. Kissinger during the grinding talks with North Vietnamese negotiators in Paris that culminated in the Paris Peace Accords of 1973. He was with President Nixon in Moscow during the first, his first presidential trip there and the historic arms control treaties in May 1972. And he was there for Kissinger shuttles between the Arabs and, and Israelis after the 1973 Yom Kippur War. And he was a key actor in President Nixon's historic trip to China in February 1972, known popularly as the week that changed the world. Ambassador Lord went to hold such posts as State Department Director of Policy Planning, President of the, Cou of the Council on Foreign Relations, Ambassador of the People's Republic of China, and Assistant Secretary of State for Southeast Asian and Pacific Affairs. From 2015 to 2016, he conducted several hours of oral histories with Dr. Kissinger on behalf of the Nixon Foundation. And the collection of interviews cover a variety of subject matter, uh, China, Russia, the Middle East, Vietnam, leadership strategy, and statesmanship, and can be now found in this highly readable book with Ambassador Lord's commentary. It's called Kissinger on Kissinger, Reflections on Diplomacy, Grand Strategy, and Leadership, and it is available for purchase in our museum store, and Ambassador Lord will sign copies for you in the Annenberg Court. Ambassador Lord will be inter interviewed by Dr. Frank Gannon. Uh, Dr. Gannon obtained his master's degree at the London School of Economics and a doctorate at, at Oxford. After working in advertising at J. Walter Thompson, he worked with Sir Randolph Churchill to write the definitive biography of Sir Randolph's father, the Prime Minister Winston Churchill. In 1971, Gannon became a White House Fellow under Donald Rumsfeld in the Nixon administration and went on to serve on the Domestic Council and under White House Press Secretary Ron Ziegler. In 1974, Gannon left Washington to California aboard Air Force One following President Nixon's resignation and was the Chief Editorial Assistant on President Nixon's best-selling memoir, RN. He has the rare distinction of having interviewed President Nixon for, 30, for 38 hours in 1983, which are all available for, in, uh, which, are, which are all available in digital format at the Nixon Presidential Library. We will see some of these videos in this presentation tonight. I should also mention that yesterday, uh, our President Hugh Hewitt uh, visited Dr. Kissinger in New York City, uh, knowing that Ambassador Lord was going to be speaking tonight at the Nixon Library. Dr. Kinsinger asked Hugh to pass on his best wishes to everyone here tonight and watching on C-SPAN, and he asked for us to note that Winston Lord is an indispensable partner and a very good friend. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce to the Nixon Library stage Dr. Frank Gannon and Ambassador Winston Lord. and, and uh, honor to add what uh, Hugh uh, Hewitt uh, bring, brought fresh from uh, Henry Kissinger. I found uh, one of several references to you in the various Kissinger memoirs. Uh, I won't read the one about you being a terrible punster. Uh, but this one, uh, he says, uh, he, you, became one of my best collaborators, a resident conscience, and a close friend. More than almost anyone, he was familiar with my views. He had a global, not simply a regional perspective. 
So praise from Caesar is praise indeed. <laughs> and of course, after the association with uh, Dr. Kissinger and in the Nixon White House, you went on to a very distinguished career, which could be the subject of another uh, talk. But And I'm in the curious position that you have a book, an excellent book, uh, which is the uh, your edition of the uh, number of interviews you conducted with Dr. Kissinger. So it's in the cu I'm in the curious position of asking you to comment on Henry Kissinger's things. So rather than doing that, I'll refer to some of the things in the book, but it will be kind of open-ended. And the advantage of the book is it's very short, it's very accessible, and it's really interesting. Uh, so I would recommend uh, the best thing to do is to buy it and, and read it. Uh, you can't you can't go wrong. Uh, it's also appropriate that you're uh, here at the library because I think the Nixon Foundation played a part in the genesis of these interviews. Well, first, a few <clears throat> personal grace notes. I've been going around the country promoting this book, but there's literally no other scene than this one that compares with this one in terms of the appropriateness and the relevance for reasons you and Jonathan have already touched upon. First, of course, it is the Nixon Library and museum, and this is about the Nixon-Kissinger foreign policy. <clears throat> uh, secondly, Frank himself uh, conducted 30 hours of interviews with President Nixon, or 38 hours. Uh, and so in a book that's based on interviews, that's also very relevant, not to mention the fact he was in the White House uh, when I was. Thirdly, the foundation has actually been absolutely crucial, and I'm delighted to see Mrs. Hewitt here. I'm delighted that Hugh is the new president. He'll be terrific. And he interviewed me on this book, by the way. So the interviews we did, and we can get in more detail, but we did several interviews, first of panels on some of the key events that are in this volume. And then we prevailed upon Kissinger to do one interview to reflect back on these events it's extraordinary. He's 93 when he did the interviews, reflecting on events that were 50 years old. And it's just amazing the precision. We barely touched the transcript. What you read here would be extraordinary for a 30-year-old talking about last week's news. But for a 92-year-old talking about 50 years ago, it's really uh, quite extraordinary. But the point I'm making is that the foundations, together with the National Archives, supported these interviews, and no one was more indispensable than the person who introduced this, Jonathan Providers, uh, who ran the, the videos, who was absolutely essential in the composition and editing of the videos, and giving other advice. Uh, he worked closely for Jeff Shepard, who's also involved. Uh, and if it wasn't for Jonathan and Jeff uh, and the foundation, which I mentioned in my acknowledgments, we wouldn't have this book. One last comment, I mentioned Hugh's interview of the book and my moving around uh, and the fact you can buy this afterwards. So we're looking for ways to make this a bestseller. You all certainly can help. But we have another idea that we're toying with. <clears throat> we put out a press release on the book before it was issued. And a good friend of mine, Tom Brokaw, I hate to drop names, but Tom saw the press release on his iPhone. So a very small space, and the iPhone cut off the last two letters of the book. So Tom got, <laughs> you see what's coming, right? <laughs> Tom got very excited and wrote out about 100 copies, thinking he was getting a book, Kissinger on Kissing. <laughs> so we may change the title to uh, sort of boost boost the sales. Nixon liked uh, firsts, and he liked to spring surprises. And uh, his announcement of his first two principal advisors ticked all those boxes. His chief domestic advisor was a Harvard professor who was a Kennedy uh, supporter and, uh, and, uh, and uh, a member of the Kennedy administration. And his principal foreign advisor was a Harvard professor who had uh, worked for his political rival. In, your, in the interviews, Dr. Kissinger tells to you, says to you, if you consider that I spent 15 years of my life trying to keep him from becoming president, it remains astonishing that he chose me for his security advisor. The politics breeds strange bedfellows, but Nixon and Kissinger were a truly odd couple. Right. What do you think 
Nixon saw in Kissinger, and why do you think Kissinger said yes? First of all, let me thank you for that excerpt. It sets up the era and the book itself very nicely. <clears throat> it was a strange alliance, and Nixon showed great courage in doing this. I mean, he was a conservative from the West Coast, distrustful of the Ivy League and Harvard professors, uh, quintessential wasp American. Here you have a Jewish immigrant teaching at Harvard and working for Nelson Rockefeller. It's not foreordained. They had actually never, never met, maybe once at a social meeting. Nixon had read Kissinger's books. Nixon wanted to dominate foreign policy. He was so well-versed and so interested in this. And he knew to do that, he needed a very able, thoughtful uh, national security advisor. And so he put politics aside and thought about the national interest and also what would serve his interest in forging a new world order. Uh, and so just the sheer brilliance of uh, Nixon had already exhibited that drew him to him. Now I'll get back to one other aspect, namely the view of the world. But let me get to Henry's acceptance. As, as he himself says shamefacedly, when he was asked by the president, to his surprise, to be national security advisor, instead of saying yes immediately, he hesitated. Uh, partly out of misplaced, in this case, loyalty to Rockefeller, partly not entirely sure of what Nixon was going to be doing. And he went to Rockefeller, who chewed him out, and said, you've got to serve your country. What the heck are you doing? He's taking the chance, not you, by picking you. And Henry, of course, immediately saw that. And Henry would have said yes anyway, because his main motive would be serving the national interest. Here's someone who had analyzed foreign policy and history all his life, and I'm sure he left it the chance to do something about it in terms of policy. He had been advisor to JFK uh, and uh, consulted with Johnson and other presidents. So these are the main motives. And then what really brought them together, and it's in the forward to the book that Henry writes, is their common approach to foreign policy, which we've just seen examples of, namely a strategic conceptual approach that looks at the world in long-term trends that takes into account the impact of what you do in one area with one country on others, uh, and which not, does not just react in knee-jerk fashion to discrete events, but ties them together in a mosaic. And so it was clear that they each shared a strategic worldview, which I think was probably a major reason that Nixon chose him, as well as the others I mentioned, and clearly why Kissinger was happy to join him. And they brought different strengths Nixon as a congressman, but then more importantly as vice president, and then as private citizen, had traveled the world extensively and knew many world leaders and studied foreign policy and was the best prepared president ever for foreign policy. Uh, Kissinger's strength was historical, philosophical, conceptual, strategic. They had the same instincts on strategy, but one brought the resonance of history and the other brought the immediacy of knowledge of world affairs. So it was a wonderful mix, but it was not foreordained. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the president and, or the president-elect and uh, wanted to bring the uh, foreign policy apparatus into the White House. You have a very interesting thing that I hadn't seen before, where uh, Nixon and Kissinger go out to see uh, the ailing and, in fact, dying uh, General Eisenhower at Walter Reed. And uh, he gives them some very specific advice. And, and Henry Kissinger also has kind of a brush with the, uh, with the, uh, the former general. It's an interesting anecdote. And what's interesting about this book, that Henry not only recalls st strategies and specific milestones, but he punctuates his recounting with anecdotes, some revealing, some amusing. In this case, it was early in the administration. Kissinger had the conventional mistaken view that Eisenhower was a decent guy but wasn't brilliant, you know. He soon learned differently. And by the way, Eisenhower, I think, is one of our great presidents, in my opinion. So they went out to, as a, as a courtesy, 
in one sense, but also given Eisenhower's interest in, in national issues. And, and they just had an NSC meeting on the Middle East, I think it was. And they went out and briefed him uh, at Walter Reed Hospital. The very next day, not because of their meeting, but because of somebody on the NSC, there was a leak in the press about what had happened. The meeting, the very things they told Eisenhower about. And Eisenhower chewed Kissinger out, saying, how dare you let this stuff get out in the public you just told me about. And Kissinger sort of said, well, I'm not sure I can control this. And he said, young man, if you can't control these kind of things, do a better job, you don't deserve it. And he gained Henry's great respect uh, as a result of that. That was uh, from the very first, in the very first weeks of the administration, right. plagued by leaks. And that was, I think they had briefed Eisenhower on the most secret plan for the Middle East, and the right. next day it's on the front page right. of the New York Times. So was, um, before we get into talking about the book, I want to talk a little bit about you. When you were um, a high school student in the uh, early 50s, uh, what did you think you wanted to be when you grew up? Uh, Secretary of State, I got it. <laughs> no, actually, I did have an interest in international relations uh, and foreign policy fairly early on for two reasons. One, my mother uh, was very much in the public service, uh, national co-chairman for Eisenhower, by the way. But she took Eleanor Roosevelt's place as ambassador to the UN for Human Rights, and she was involved in a lot of international as well as domestic issues. So. We sat around the dinner table, these issues would come up. Uh, and then secondly, I did an awful lot of traveling when I was young. Uh, my, one of my vacations from Yale was Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan, you know, just to take a casual example. So these two forces suggested I wanted to go into this field, but I wasn't quite sure how. And so I made sure I took a broad education English major at Yale, so I figure writing's important no matter what. Took a lot of political science and history courses and then went to the graduate school where I met my wife at the Fletcher School. She took extremely good notes in economics class and that was my weak subject, so I decided to become her friend. So that's how we, uh, that's how we got going on that. So you were an English major who became a diplomat. She was an economics major who became a best-selling novelist. That's correct. That's the... well, she originally was a chemistry major, but she blew up the lab, and she said, you better go to some other <laughs> discipline. <laughs> what... Literally true, by the way. <laughs> what then, you also, you had a very, to put it mildly, a very distinguished academic career. What was the path that led you to Kissinger? <clears throat> it was really by chance. I. I'd gone from the Foreign Service to the Defense Department policy planning staff. And I worked for a brilliant young person, and it's really ironic, named Mort Halper, yeah. who ended up suing Kissinger uh, later for, I won't get into the details. But Kissinger knew Halpern from Yale. He asked him to join his staff. He was putting together, and Halpern uh, wanted me to go with him. And so I went over to join, uh, join the staff a month after it started, February 1969. Uh, but we shouldn't spend too much time on me. We ought to spend it on Kissinger and Nixon. But it was obviously a great opportunity. Uh, <clears throat> we started out, and this gets to Kissinger. Uh, I had to have an interview with him. He basically took me on help and say so, but it was a 15-minute interview, and you can see already the, the dynamism and the chaos of the front office he was about to see. Secretary of the Treasury was on the phone looking at memos. But he zeroed in on me on, on a key issue. He said, look, I want debate. I want disagreement. I want good intellectual exchange from my staff. But if you lose the battle on a policy, I want you to carry it out loyally, which I think is the correct approach. And uh, I guess I passed that test. And the point here is that the first year, I was not in his front office. I was sitting across the Eisenhower office and among other things, besides running the NSC system, is we would send Kissinger memos like a mini policy planning staff, looking ahead, being devil's advocate, challenging. And I wrote several memos that were critical, or at least raising questions about some of the things that Nixon and Kissinger were doing. He hired me as a special assistant, not despite that, but because of that. He did not like yes men or yes women. He wanted debate. Now, he would be brutal if you gave mushy or sentimental advocacy for an issue. 
<clears throat> but as long as you argued it intelligently, uh, he respected that. So this was a good example of uh, someone who encouraged uh, debate. He, he is, uh, was, and I, I suspect is, because he goes to the office every day, um, a legendarily difficult boss. Let's take the, uh, and some of the stories I assume have to be where there's smoke, there's some fire. Let's take the Larry Eagleburger story. True, untrue, apocryphal? Uh, true. Uh, the story quickly is Eagleburger was one of his top assistants, and they were in the middle of some crisis, and Eagleburger fainted in Kissinger's office. And Kissinger essentially, I wasn't there, so I'm not entirely sure this is true, but it's a good story. He stepped over the guy's body to get to the phone and start working on the, <laughs> the next issue. Uh, I'll give you another example. Look, I have unbelievable respect and affection for Henry. Uh, even if you don't send him the transcript of this meeting, I'm going to be nice about him <laughs> behind his back. But he wasn't perfect, unlike some of us here this evening. Uh, <laughs> He was extremely demanding. As I say in my portrait, and I, if you read nothing else, I'd like you to read my foreword and my personal portrait of Henry, because nobody that close to him has ever done this. Of course, I round out some of the edges, but uh, I do refer to some of the less attractive uh, aspects. But uh, I, he stretched my nerves and patience, but he also stretched my horizons and perspectives, and I learned a great deal, of course, about how to approach foreign policy, and I've always been, as I say in the book, appreciative to him for the climb as well as the view, but the climb can be very arduous, and I'll give you one example, speech writing. I, I can write fairly well, nowhere near like my wife, but she does fiction, I do nonfiction. Uh, so I did speeches for Henry, and sometimes indirectly for the president, it would go something like this. First of all, the timing would generally be just before the Redskins kicked off against the Cowboys in a football game. I was a rabid fan. He called me up and said he wanted me to work on a speech. So that was pretty annoying. It's one reason I quit about once a week. Uh, but here's how it would go in speech writing. This is about 90% true. It gives you the flavor. It may not be, you know, accurate in every word. He, he, Give me a topic to write a speech. And I'd come in a few days later with a draft. And he'd call me in his office the next day, and he'd say, is this the best you can do? And I'd say, Henry, I think so, but let me take another whack at it. So I go away, do a second draft, come in, calls me into his office a day later, and says, are you sure this is the best you can do? And I said, really? I thought so, Henry. Let me try again. Anyway, this goes on for six drafts. And I'm getting a little annoyed. I finally say in the sixth draft, when I know he's asked me this question, Henry, I've looked at every sentence. I've tweaked every colon and semicolon. I can't improve this speech anymore. It's the best I can do. So Henry would turn to me and smile and said, in that case, now I'll read it. <laughs> <laughs> so he would stretch it. Now, by the way, he would push me on speech writing or writing memos to the president for him because he knew I could write. Another staff member might be good on research or negotiations. He wouldn't push that person. So he had a sense of where to push and where not to push. Uh, you recommend reading your uh, forward. Uh, I should have said this book not only has, it's not only the edited uh, transcript of interviews that are arranged uh, in, a, in a very uh, uh, interesting and useful way, but it has an introduction by Dr. Kissinger. It has your uh, set up, and then you uh, you have introductions to each of the chapters. You know, I wrote the introductions to the and try to frame the chapters, yeah. And the form, and then occasional interpositions of uh, information, and then uh, the questions that you asked. So it's it's not un, it's not uninterrupted. It's not at all uninterrupted reading of just edited transcripts. Did you very, come on my book tour with me? Uh, yes. Well, I. <laughs> um, in the book. He uh, has an interesting assessment of uh, Nixon's strategic vision, and he talks about him as uh, one of his main contributions was the, that he was uh, interested in the concept, the con conceptual aspects of foreign policy. And he writes, uh, or he says to you, Nixon was, except for the founding fathers, and I would say Teddy Roosevelt, the American president who thought of foreign policy as grand strategy. To him, foreign policy was the structural improvement of the relationship of countries to each other, 
in a way that the balancing of their self-interests would promote global peace and the security of the United States. And he thought about that in relatively long-range uh, terms. Is that the way you thought of or think of uh, Nixon's? Uh, oh, absolutely. Now, let me say this. I'm the last remaining centrist in America. I'm a flaming centrist. I mention that because I've worked for Republican and Democratic presidents. I've voted for both. I was a political appointee of Reagan and of Clinton. Uh, so when I say that of the seven presidents I've served, that Nixon was by far the most formidable in foreign policy, this is coming from a relatively objective, although I've worked for him, obviously, but I've worked for other presidents. So he was in the class by himself. Look, the man had flaws. We all know that. Who doesn't? But you cannot take away the strategic approach. And it's described well both in this uh, film and also, as you just said. And it's one reason why he and Kissinger got along, as I said earlier, because they approached things the same way. And he not only uh, he did a couple of things that were important. He knew exactly how to work with Kissinger. First of all, the worldviews coincided. But he struck a beautiful balance. Some presidents micromanage. And for example, Jimmy Carter used to determine who could play on the tennis court. Actually, that's a pretty important subject. <laughs> Not a bad idea. But and, and whereas some others would delegate completely. Nixon, of course, had the White House dominate the process. He had to make the courageous decisions, how to end the Vietnam War, open to China, where you don't know what the reaction is going to be, going into the Middle East, and so on. And he had to back up Kissinger. And he had a strategic approach, which Kissinger could reflect. But then he left it to Henry to do the actual negotiations and the tactics, and never second-guessed them. And Henry always had the confidence they had enough shared worldview that on tactics, he would be backed up by the president. For example, when we were in China uh, negotiating the Shanghai communique before the historic visit, this was in October, it was a public visit. I won't go into detail now, we can get back to it, but the Chinese presented a totally different approach how we should approach the communique, totally different from what Nixon had approved before we left Washington. And in those days, there was no way to communicate back home. We were on our own. But Kissinger was sufficiently confident of the president's view and his loyalty that he agreed to the Chinese approach, which proved to be very successful in the Shanghai communique. So it just shows you how they work together. So that was uh, uh, extremely important as well. In addition to Nixon's uh, sort of long-term grand strategic vision, uh, there's an axiom that uh, Dr. Kissinger quotes, I think at least three and maybe four times in the book, so it meant something to him, about no half measures. Right. Well, he believed that you, you're going to pay a price for some controversial pro policy, whether you go halfway or go all out. And so rather than, of course, the China visit was carefully set up. We can get into that both publicly and privately over two years. But still, it was a very bold move to send his national security advisor secretly to China, not knowing we had enough confidence that the Chinese had a self-interest because of the threats from the Soviets that they'd want to engage with. And we made sure it would go beyond Taiwan before we went. But he couldn't know how the reaction was going to be uh, back home. But he went full, full bore on that, or taking a chance of negotiating in the Middle East uh, versus the Soviet influence. Uh, before the Moscow summit, which came shortly after the China summit, came about because of the China summit, because we got their attention, triangular diplomacy, uh, Hanoi launched a major offensive against South Vietnam just as we were about to go to Moscow. And the president ordered very tough response, both bombing and mining of the harbors, even though he thought it might jeopardize the summit, which we had worked on for so long, which had major arms control Berlin economic agreements teed up, would have been a tremendous loss. But he wasn't about to go to Moscow while American and South Vietnamese are getting slaughtered by North, the, Moscow's allies. Now, by the way, Kissinger and I and others thought that this bombing and so on, even though it was correct in terms of policy in Vietnam, was probably going to sink the summit. I remember going in a helicopter up to Camp David to write the speech 
and we were bemoaning all these great agreements we had teed up are going to go down the tubes. Nixon said, no, the Soviets will go ahead with the summit. They have too much self-interest in it. And he was absolutely right. Now, an interesting episode happened to play out there. When we're in Moscow, <clears throat> I was in charge of, of Henry's and the president's briefing books. And we were sitting uh, in an office near the Kremlin, or in the Kremlin. And there was a space agreement being signed by Brezhnev and Nixon. And then they were going to take a break for half an hour. We're all going to go out in a motorcade to Brezhnev's dacha to talk about Vietnam. Because they had, even though they agreed to have us come while we were bombing the hell out of their allies, they had to be tough with us and send a transcript to Hanoi to show they were loyal as lips and teeth and so on. Well, what happened was Brezhnev got Nixon to go out immediately uh, in a motorcade without stopping, leaving me behind with the briefing books. And I frankly, knowing Henry's temper, I said, oh my god, he's going to be really happy. I don't have the president's briefing books there for the meeting, even though it wasn't my fault. We managed to talk the Russian KGB into another car to go out there. We got there in time, thank god. But it was. But the point here was it led up to a very interesting evening of getting into this question of Nixon's courage to go there and the Russian reaction. We sat for three hours while the four top Soviet leaders attacked Nixon on Vietnam so they could send the transcript to Hanoi. Uh, and Nixon just basically sat there, didn't try to engage. He knew they were going through a, a charade. Uh, we then go upstairs for a banquet, and the mood changes completely, and Brezhnev starts trying to get us all drunk, and it's camaraderie, and it's like nothing had ever happened. And then he made Kissinger sit down with Pomiko, the foreign minister, and negotiated salt at 2 AM in the morning after about three hours of vodka and so on. So <laughs> my whole point here in this very long, meandering story is that Nixon did have the qualities both of vision. As Henry said, how do you get from here to there? And sometimes it's lonely. Uh, and the courage to make those decisions. And it's particularly tough for a leader to make these decisions because early in a crisis, you don't have full information, and therefore you have to take a courageous decision based on inadequate knowledge of the landscape of what's going to happen. So you're quite lonely in taking a risk based on incomplete knowledge. But if you wait until you have so much knowledge that the path is certain. By then, you're hemmed in, and you can't do what you wanted to do. So it's very tough on these uh, tactical decisions can be made by a president. And they're usually fairly tough, because otherwise the bureaucracy would take care of it, but it gets bumped up to the president. But these strategic big step decisions are the most difficult. So that's what you need at a president. Doesn't uh, Dr. Kissinger says it's 5149, but the decisions that the, the decisions that can be made at a lower level are, That's good. and it's the president that gets the tough ones where it's, uh, yeah. I'll give you one other example of Kissinger, I mean uh, Nixon on foreign policy in terms of his interest and care. Uh, I was in charge of assembling his briefing books. Now, others did most of the contributions, but I had to put them together and also help write some of it. We put together six briefing books about this thick, and I, I swear that Nixon read every page because it was marked up. Almost every page was marked up. And even as we were flying in Air Force One and stopping in Guam and Hawaii, sitting in the back of Air Force One, he would send memos back saying, I want to know about this, or what does Mao think of this, or what's a favorite poem I can use in my toast, or are the, what are the Chinese going to say on North Korea, that kind of thing. It was amazing. I've been to lots of summits. I've never seen a president work that hard for a, a meeting. Ambassador, Ambassador Lord, as I'm sure many or uh, all of you know, is in our the introductory video to the new uh, library, to the new exhibits, and that's the point you make that right. you say that you had never you served eight presidents, seven, seven presidents, but who's counting? <laughs> and uh, and uh, none were as prepared right. as uh, yeah. another aspect of this book is that it's sort of a master class in applied diplomacy: uh, China, Russia, Vietnam, the Middle East. Uh, to start with China, now we know that it worked out well. But at the time, uh, Nixon's, uh, uh, the idea, the notion of going to China was crazy, was, was unthinkable. And uh, 
some, even one of our major ambassadors refused to believe it until he was called back. And uh, how did you, how did that, and, and Nixon also, he had sort of announced it in the first weeks in the, uh, uh, in the uh, White House. How did, the, how did you receive word of this and what did you think about yeah, this it? This is, of course, I can't do justice and I want to make sure we have time for other questions and for the audience. Uh, by the way, getting at the China decision and courage again, Nixon and Kissinger consulted many outside experts as well as collecting information, even when it was still secret, that people didn't know what it was for, but we got a lot of help from the experts. He also called in outsiders, and Nixon talked to the four top experts in the State Department or retired experts on the Soviet Union, George Kennan, Tommy Thompson, Foy Kohler, and one other, I forget who it was. They all told him, do not move toward China. They could see through some public gestures that we were trying to change our policy. And they said, if you go toward China, uh, you're going to wreck relations with Moscow. Nixon and Kissinger did not believe this, but it took courage to go against all these Soviet experts. And in fact, just the opposite. The Soviets had been dragging their feet on a summit. We had asked with a like one for a couple of years. Henry mentioned this in his film. Uh, and we had resisted pressures. We had some crises, but we weren't making any progress with the Soviets on arms control or Berlin or any of these things. On the way, in a public trip, which covered our secret trip in July 71, I was in Thailand, and I got a call from Al Haig, the deputy to Kissinger, who said in sign language that didn't fool anybody listening on the phone, but he basically said, the Russians have once again turned down a summit. So that meant we would give the Chinese the summit first. Uh, we then, as soon as we got back from the secret trip, Nixon announced in San Clemente the fact that Kissinger had been there and he was going to go the next year. Within days, the Russians agreed to a summit. Within weeks, they moved on arms control in Berlin. So it just proved the uh, people who I greatly respect, I and mean, there's nobody I respect more than George Kennan, but it just shows you how even the smartest people can get things wrong and what courage it took to go against this. In the section on Vietnam, uh, Dr. Kissinger, I think, really definitively uh, lays low two of the ongoing controversies. I think you, I forget, you call them shibble, uh, shibboleths, yeah. uh, or troublesome shibboleths or something. And one is that the, the notion that the agreement that was achieved in 73 could have been achieved earlier. Uh, can you? Yeah. Uh, look, Vietnam is controversial, and no one can sit here and say, it was a splendid outcome. It was a terrible outcome because the North Vietnamese violated the agreement. So I understand the controversy. And God knows we lost a lot of lives and money. And I respect those who felt we shouldn't have gone in or we should have gone out sooner. I don't respect those who glorified the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese as the good guys and the, the bad guys or that our presidents were baby killers. But I do respect those who disagree. But, uh, on the agreement itself, there are two persistent critiques that I just disagree with completely. And I mentioned this in the book. One is that we could have had the eventual deal sooner. And the other, the shibboleth, is the deal we got was a cynical, fake one, knowing South Vietnam would collapse after a, quote, decent interval, which would cover interval. our rear end. Another way of saying is we never should have made the deal that we should have made sooner. I mean, it's, you can't have both arguments. Now, very quickly, because this is a big subject, we ought to get to other things. We insisted that any eventual deal be a military settlement only and leave the future political fate of Vietnam to, this, to North and South Vietnam. We weren't going to overthrow the Saigon government as we left, which is what they demanded until a month before our presidential election. And they saw Nixon was going to get reelected. It's going to be four more years of this madman. They better make a deal. And so they caved in and gave us a military settlement only. This exceeded the expectation of critics who thought we would have a coalition government as well as withdrawal. And a coalition government was the first step toward a collapse or at least a communist takeover. We held out against that, and we managed to beat the Vietnamese at that game. However, that deal was never possible to go to the first shibboleth before then. We outlined this 
as early as the Nixon speech in 1970, very casually there, but still. And we gave a specific seven-point proposal that I helped draft in May 71, which laid out the eventual settlement. They said, no, 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 you've got to get rid of the Saigon government, let us take over. And, and otherwise, you can't just leave. We couldn't even get our prisoners back. So uh, the first argument that we could have had as soon is absolute nonsense. Second argument, people can disagree on, because after all, collapse, right? And people can say, we should have known that the South Vietnamese weren't that strong, or that the Congress would not back up enforcement. But we felt the deal, first place, it was not a decent interval. Nixon and Kissinger, Nixon refused to have any settlement before the election because he wanted to have a deal that was credible and not one to help him get reelected. Uh, so they did the best they could, and we felt that the deal, we were not naive about Hanoi's treachery, but we felt with this military settlement only that the deal could survive and we were not looking for a decent interval. We're looking for a decent opportunity for South Vietnam to determine its future and that America couldn't be there forever. We had expended our lives and our treasure. We had trained them and built up their forces. And at some point, the American people deserved to have us turn over the war, although under honorable conditions. So we felt that if it was a minor ceasefire violation, the South Vietnamese were strong enough to handle it with our economic and military aid. We felt incorrectly and naively, perhaps, that if there was a major invasion, as there was, that the US Congress and people would back bombing to prevent that. Not sending in troops. Nobody wanted to do that. But at least after all these expenditures and the credibility and North Vietnamese treachery, we thought, even with the anti-war move, that people would be willing to, to go back and bomb. That was wrong, it turned out. But we, we honestly thought that would be the case. Thirdly, we offered economic incentives to Hanoi as well as our allies so that the Hanoi Politburo could debate among themselves, let's put off our objectives, let's take the aid for reconstruction, uh, and, and let's go along with this deal. We got rid of the American troops, and we'll just bide our time but take the aid. So we thought that'd be incentive. Fourthly, we thought China and Russia, in their own self-interest, not wanting this issue to flare up again between us, would help persuade Hanoi to behave themselves. Well, these assumptions did not work out. Reasonable people can challenge it, but they have to come up with what should we have done, stayed on longer uh, with the American opinion the way it was, and after all we have done for South Vietnam, or go all out and use nukes and bombs. I mean, they just weren't great alternatives. Because of the anguish, I respect those who disagree, but I don't respect these two arguments, which I think are phony. Uh, earlier, just earlier tonight, did you say that uh, Dr. Kissinger says that that, that that moment, I think in October 72, when the North Vietnamese changed for the first time their position and made a settlement possible, was the most emotional? We thought of that as the most Yeah, but Henry's been asked in other forums, not just when I've been president, or not just as he does in this book, what was the single greatest highlight of his career, at least in emotional terms? And he said, when Hanoi came around to our position in October 72, after three exhausting years of secret negotiations and after all the fighting and treasure, uh, and that he, we went out in the garden after the meeting as a take a break, and he shook my hand and said, we've done it. And it was meaningful, obviously, mostly because of the Vietnam situation, getting our POWs back, ending this anguish on, we thought, honorable terms. But personally, between us, it was meaningful because in 1970, without going into detail, I came very close to quitting the staff because I opposed the Cambodian incursion, not on legal or ethical grounds, but in practical domestic opposition grounds and military utility grounds. I was very close to quitting. My wife talked me out of it. and She's always steered me in the right direction. And Henry said, as did my wife, look, you can go around waving a placard, or you can stay here and work for peace. And so given that background, I almost left over Vietnam for us to be working together and have a breakthrough it was obviously emotional for me, but I've been touched by the fact that he cites that at the top of his list. One last question for me before we open to the audience, who I expect will have some more uh, contemporary questions. Um, on the 
August 8th, the night of the, that the president made his resignation speech, uh, Henry Kissinger asked if he could walk, after the speech, if he could walk Nixon home uh, to, from the Oval Office to the uh, residence, as he had done on so many happier occasions. And I think trying to uh, cheer up Nixon, uh, Kissinger says, you know, uh, Mr. President, history will treat you well. And Nixon says, uh, Henry, that depends on who writes the history. Um, it's uh, 50 years since Nixon became president, 45 since he resigned, 25 since he died. How is history treating Richard Nixon? That's a good question because it's hard to generalize. It depends what platform you're talking about. <clears throat> I think it's oversimplified for even his critics to point to the China opening as if that's the only thing he did. If you look at this exhibit, I must say in domestic policy, whether it's the environment or women's rights or going off the gold standard as well as his foreign policy, but other, the Middle East and, and detente, uh, it's, it's just wrong for the critics just to say that's the only good thing he did. I mean, sort of the simplified obit is Watergate and opening of China. And even on China, they say, well, it was sort of inevitable. Well, it was easier for him than it would have been for Hubert Humphrey because Nixon's right flank was protected, whereas Humphrey would have gotten pummeled by the, by the Republicans. But it, was, it took great courage, as I said, and even on Air Force One coming back home from Beijing, Nixon and Kissinger were worried about the reception domestically to what had just happened. They didn't realize the impact of television and the Chinese military army playing American songs and the toasting and the first summit that really television had a major impact in. And so it was seen as a great triumph. And by the way, it helped the morale of the American people who had been fatigued, uh, not only by the Vietnam War, but, but uh, racial riots, assassinations, demonstrations and people were just <clears throat> depressed and to see that you could open up to one quarter of humanity sort of put the ambivalent exit from Vietnam in perspective in terms of what was important and it also showed that we could still act on the world stage and I think Nixon and Kitchener deserve great credit for these sort of generic ethereal points as well as the specific objectives. Uh, I, I think the longer we go on, the kinder history will be. Now, let's face it, some of the criticism of him, and I say that in the Nixon Library, and someone who you obviously I respected, he did some bad things, and he paid for them, and it's a shame. I, I'm not saying they were not deservedly paid for. I mean, he, he just did things that was unfortunate. And this man, because of sort of paranoia about his enemies, some of which was justified, just went into a dark area that it's just a shame because uh, he was poised to be a truly great president, in my opinion. Now it's going to be a mixed bag, as it should be, because he made mistakes. But he'd just been reelected by an incredible landslide. He had the war behind us. He had opened up to China. He had the taunt with the Soviet Union. He was moving to solidify alliances with our friends. He was moving into the Middle East. He had a record on domestic policy that was sufficiently uh, attractive that a very liberal columnist for the New York Times wrote a, a book, which he said, I disagree with the first half, Nixon was lousy in foreign policy, but he was terrific in domestic affairs. And this was from a liberal. He had Pat Moynihan, and uh, it, wasn't, it was moderate, it wasn't liberal policy. So uh, it's just a shame that, and we all know it was the cover-up, it wasn't the crime, that this so destroyed his presidency. He'll still go down as a good president, but he could have been a great president except for this unnecessary, self-inflicted wound, and it's really, really tragic. I might add that Kissinger is doing an extensive portrait of Nixon. He's already done that uh, for a forthcoming book, along with portraits of other leaders. It'll be very interesting to see what he has to say. Before we go to questions, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Ambassador Winston. Thank you. Before we get to questions, I just want to remind everyone that Kissinger on Kissinger is available in the store. And as I said earlier, Ambassador Lord will sign your copies. I'd like to start out with the first question. As the former ambassador to the People's Republic of China, could you comment uh, a little bit on the situation in Hong Kong right now. Relations with China? 
Well, excuse me. On the current situation in Hong Kong. Oh, Hong Kong, excuse me, yes. <clears throat> I think the Hong Kong demonstrations, on the one hand, are extremely hopeful and a bright spot on the horizon, but also makes one extremely apprehensive. After the Berlin Wall fell, democracy is on the march, and countries are turning to more democratic regimes, and it looked like the end of history, to use a quote. We got too confident about it. The last 10 years, particularly the last few years, we've gone in reverse, whether it's China getting much more repressive, Putin following his usual act, but Hungary and, and Turkey and uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, other t tendencies Obviously, populism and nationalism are on the rise in democracies somewhat on retreat. I don't think that's permanent, but it's depressing. Well, we've seen a few flickers lately around the world that may be somewhat of a comeback, that people who want freedom have not given up. You see it in Turkey, you see it in Hungary, you see it even in the Soviet Union, on a limited scale, obviously. But Hong Kong is the most dramatic example it's about other issues as well, uh, housing and inequality, corruption, but it's a bit, essentially Hong Kong wants to be Hong Kong and not another Chinese city, and they want freedom. Now, the agreement that the British made with the Chinese, on the one hand, absolutely guaranteed civil liberties, but it was a little vaguer on elections. And by the way, democracy is more than elections. It's freedom of press, independent judiciary, and so on. So these, uh, these civil liberties have been eroded over the, it started out relatively well with China pr promised to let Hong Kong be different and one country, two systems. But that's been eroding. The self-censorship as well as censorship in the press, the rule of law is beginning to fray around the edges uh, and the Chinese have been kidnapping publishers of books, literally who publish books they didn't like. Uh, Anyway, there's a lot of things going on. And then it was brought to a head, as I'm sure most of you know, by a bill that the Hong Kong government, puppets of Beijing, introduced, which in effect said that you should extradite to China and its awful non-legal system, anybody we don't like. I'm oversimplifying. And that was the final straw. So that's what the demonstrations are about. It's extraordinary they're going on for 15 months. Now, that's the good news. The bad news is that we, and we should encourage it. We should speak out on their behalf. There's a bill in the Congress which would effectively try to deter the Chinese from cracking down by saying, in effect, if you crack down, we'll no longer re reflect the status of Hong Kong being a different type of city. You get the same financial and economic treatment there as you get elsewhere in China, uh, which would really hurt them. I mean, the GDP used to be 20% in Hong Kong. It's only 3%, but they depend on Hong Kong as a through station for finance and investment. So this would be a great deterrent against the Chinese cracking down. I think we should pass the bipartisan bill. It's nice to have something in Washington that's bipartisan that's there. It would also hold accountable through visas and seizing of assets any leaders who were involved in the crackdown, whether it's Hong Kong or Chinese. So that's what we ought to do. But uh, there's no way that China, and this leader in particular, is going to uh, let Hong Kong get out of control. And so they're not going to give in on the major demands. And part of the problem is that in this demonstration, the good news is there are no leaders, and the bad news is there are no leaders, uh, unlike previous demonstrations. So there's no way to organize the resistance and, above all, to come up with irreducible demands. They have five demands one of which wants free elections, essentially. It's not going to be met. And uh, if they had some leaders, they could at least negotiate with the Hong Kong government, tough as that is, on getting some of their demands met. But now it's sort of incohate. Uh, the Chinese don't want to go in. But trust me, if that's the only option they have to put this down, they'll go in with some thin camouflage, just like the Soviets went into Ukraine wearing green uniforms. Uh, but they much prefer their present strategy, which if you ask me to predict, I think is probably, sadly, where we'll end up, that they're going to exhaust the protesters. I mean, they've been going on now for 15 weeks. But how many times can you leave your school or your business 
put on a tear gas mask and go out there and risk your future career, uh, you know, weekend after weekend. Unfortunately, some of it's been violent, which shouldn't happen, which gives the Chinese good propaganda. So the Chinese strategy is these people are going to wear themselves out at some point, although they've already been surprised how long it's gone on. They censor all the news so they get their own citizens stoked up on nationalism by portraying the protesters as thugs beating up the police. Uh, and Chinese nationalism is on the rise. That's one way they stay in power along with uh, economic gains. Uh, they get the tycoons in Hong Kong nervous about their economic future and disruption, uh, which is happening. Uh, they'll jail what past leaders, not future ones, some of whom are in this country right now temporarily on bail. Uh, and they just figure through censorship, propaganda, pressure, the tycoon self-interest, uh, they'll finally get this thing to subside. I think that's probably what will happen. If we do have a deadline of October 1, where the Chinese have the anniversary of the 70th of the founding of the party. And it's embarrassing for this to be going on while that's happening. But I think they have to put up with that rather than resorting to a crackdown. I'm sorry to take such a long time on one question. I promise to be shorter from now on. But it's a complicated situation, as I said at the outset, that's both hopeful and dangerous. We have a question in the back row. Sir, in light of the current trade war with uh, China, what is the likelihood, because of the severe stress on the Chinese economy, the Chinese government opts for a shooting war rather than losing face by caving to Washington's A demands? shooting war? No, they won't do a shooting war. Uh, by the way, Xi is in some difficulty. As you know, he's dictator for life, and he's got all the powers of control, which means all the successes he gets credit for, but he's going to get the blame if things go wrong. And between Hong Kong and the slowing of their economy, partly by Trump being tough, uh, he may be in some difficulty, not to mention the anti-corruption campaign, which is on a scale which is good in principle, although it wiped out enemies as well as bad people. Uh, you know, we're talking hundreds of thousands of people, and, and including high level. So uh, he's in a dilemma on both these issues, and I, I've already mentioned Hong Kong. And with respect to the, to the economy, the problem is they can't figure Trump out. He's very unpredictable. Now, some say that's an asset. I think it can be to keep people off balance, but I think in this case, they've so confused the Chinese, they're just going to wait them out. I, whether we get a solution before the election depends on Trump's calculation, which is better for his re-election. Should he be Mr. Tough Guy and not have a bad deal and get attacked for doing it? Or is that going to spook the stock market and the economy and better make a deal? I think what will happen is we'll have an interim deal. The Chinese will agree to buy more soybeans, et cetera. Uh, America will lift tariffs. And uh, both sides agree to kick the can down the road on the real issues, which are technology, intellectual property theft, cyber theft, making our companies turn over technology, subsidizing the Chinese, so on. I think Trump would have been much better off. Number one, he shouldn't have withdrawn from a major international trading pact in Asia with 12 nations called the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which did a lot of things for our economy and some new issues like the environment and workers' rights, as well as opening up markets for us. Uh, but because it was done by Obama, Trump didn't like it, and he pulled out. Japan has reconstituted it without us. But we should have had that as leverage on the Chinese, both on economic issues, because all these countries don't like what China's doing either, mercantilistic and protectionist as well as geopolitical presence in Asia. It's a big mistake to, to pull out of that. So what I would do, frankly, is to go back to that pact and join it. I would settle, if I could, with our allies, the trade war, so we can get them on our side to pressure China. And on tariffs, uh, I would tend to be more selective, and I would go after state enterprises, which run against Chinese reforms. So it's in their self-interest over time to go back to private enterprise and which are the companies that are most subsidized uh, and, and most dangerous to compete with. Uh, I don't know whether that would solve the problem. But no, China won't go to a shooting war. It'll wait Trump out and be willing 
to make a, a very thin deal and kick the can down the road. We have a question right here. Um, I'm a, I am a new immigrant from China, living in Yobalinda. And in China, both uh, Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger are very well known and has very high reputation among Chinese people, particularly for Henry Kissinger. Um, the Chinese official propaganda and the state-owned newspaper like China Daily, uh, every time when uh, Henry Kissinger visited China, they call, it, they call him Chinese people's old friend. Okay, this is a very noble title from Chinese newspaper or people. And among that, only a handful of leaders, foreign leaders, enjoy that noble title, including uh, Cuba, uh, Castro, and former uh, uh, Venezuela President Charles, and Africa's Mugabe, and Kissinger is Chinese people's old friend. Do you think this is a positive, objective comment that Henry Kissinger well deserved? And if Chinese people give you that title, would you gladly accept it or no? Okay. Uh, There's many parts of the question. If I don't answer all of them, let's come back to it. First of all, I'm happy to say that there will be a Chinese edition of this book because of the interest and the approval of Kissinger. It's certainly not because of my name, although I've had something to do with the China opening. But this will be published in China. It'll be published in Russia. And tomorrow it comes out in the German edition. That's the good news. But unless we change the title, I don't think it's going to be a bestseller <laughs> in America. Uh, no, no, it's obviously an honorable uh, acclamation for Kissinger. Not only what he did with Nixon and all the opening, but he's been working tirelessly ever since as an intermediary between any American president, Democratic or Republican, and the Chinese, because Henry believes in serving whatever president's in office, whatever he thinks of that person. And so they respect not only the revolution he brought about in our relationship together with the Chinese leaders and Nixon, uh, but also that he's worked so hard ever since to have the relationship go well. And the Chinese, so the fact that they have some bad ideas like calling Mr. Castro an old friend, that's not Henry's fault to be in that company. And they don't mean that in any way. Uh, but they, they genuinely respect him. And by the way, they stick by old friends. When Nixon was downed by Watergate and was an ex-president, the Chinese warmly welcomed him and had him come over. Uh, so that's, that's their tradition. And they're very good at doing this. And they also play on that. They play on your friendship to try to get you to do favors for them. It's part of their very skillful diplomacy. We have a question right here. What subtle differences are you noticing in terms of the approach to foreign policy from the Nixon administration to other Republican administrations since then? What have we got? How many hours have we got here? <laughs> That's a huge question I can't do justice to. I mean, look, what I say is self-serving because I served in this administration, but I also served in many other administrations, Republican, Democrat. So I said this at the outset. I, I really feel this is the... I'm not saying we didn't make mistakes or Nixon and Kissinger failed in certain areas or did controversial things. Of course they did. They're human. They weren't perfect. But I do think the strategic approach that we've been discussing has never been replicated ever since. Uh, you, you don't necessarily have to have grand strategies. It sure helps, particularly when you inherit the landscape that Nixon and Kissinger did to get out of that where we had no relationship with a quarter of humanity, where we had a tense nuclear standoff with the other superpower, we had no influence really in the Middle East except with Israel. We were bogged down in a war where we had this tremendous upheaval in America. Uh, you had to have a grand strategy to get out of that, in my opinion. Uh, today, uh, or since then, we haven't seen that. It does mean we haven't had some good foreign policies. Uh, I think uh, Bush Sr. Uh, the way they handled the end of the Cold War after Reagan made the breakthrough, the way that Bush assembled a coalition of Arabs as well as other allies uh, to go into 
repulsed the invasion of Kuwait and then was smart enough not to march in Baghdad and get bogged down. Uh, so it doesn't mean you can't be successful, but no one's approached it quite with the strategic and conceptual approach uh, that Nixon and Kissinger did. We have a question right here. During the Yom Kippur War, Israel asked for help from the United States. Dr. Kissinger recommended we give them a little bit of help. Why was that his recommendation? Whereas President side. Nixon stated, Israel uh, is our ally. We're going to give them all we have. We're going to get criticized whether we give them a little bit or a whole bunch of help. So we're going to give Israel all the help we can. No, I heard the end, and that's consistent with what you pointed out. Don't do things halfway. But I didn't get the first part. I think it, the idea was that Henry advised uh, caution as opposed to is that uh, I'm not sure that's correct. Now, Henry might have said, let's package it in a way that we don't destroy any chance to deal with the Arabs, but Henry was as pro-Israel as anybody. Uh, so I don't know whether the premise of your question is correct, but leaving that- There was some it, hesitation on the part of defense, though. There was, it, it required Nixon a couple of times and finally saying, damn it, everything Oh, no, I would agree with the thrust of your question, namely that Nixon deserves great credit for this, because you bolster your negotiating position by doing this. You don't weaken it. I'm just not sure about the Kissinger lead-in, but you may be correct. I don't believe so, because I know he felt you don't separate pressure and incentives. You need both in a strategy. And so I think he would have been, I'm sure he was in favor of it. But I will point out, this is a good example of, in foreign policy, it's not just the strategic approach we've been discussing, but a sense of timing. Uh, part of the strategy when they came in was for the Middle East. Both Nixon and Kissinger wanted to supplant Soviet influence in the Middle East, which was quite extensive because of the supply of Soviet arms. Nixon and Kissinger wanted to show the Arab nations that the Soviets can help build up your armament, although it's not going to be able to defeat Israel, but you won't get any territory back and you won't move toward peace unless you have an honest broker mediator like the United States. Strong ally of Israel, but in also Israel's interest, willing to talk to both sides. So when the Yom Kippur War broke out in October 73, this is a few weeks after he became Secretary of State. By the way, it shows his coolness under pressure. I was with him in the Waldorf Astoria for the UN General Assembly sessions, and we were putting the finishing touches on a speech to the UN, and all hell breaks loose with the Yom Kippur War, and he's on the phone with the president, the foreign ministers, ambassadors, but he also sits at his desk and finishes carefully off uh, this speech. But what Henry saw, and Nixon as well, in terms of timing, was the following. At the beginning of that war, the Egyptians made major advances against the Israelis, the first time Israel had suffered military defeats. Israel, with our help, rebounded and began to move back and retake the territory. They were then at a point where they surrounded the Egyptian army and were about to wipe it out. Kissinger and I was with him, immediately went to Moscow to freeze the situation in place with a ceasefire because they figured the following. For the first time, Israel had been sobered up a little bit by its military setback and could see that maybe some negotiated settlement would be in their security interest. They, they don't, before that, they sort of suffered from hubris about their military superiority. Meanwhile, Sadat had done enough and had not yet been, had his army wiped out, which would have gone back to previous situations. So they had some dignity and self-respect, uh, and he could, without humiliation, enter into negotiations. So by freezing that situation, for the first time, Kissinger and Nixon saw, after waiting for three years, they had a chance to go into the area and begin to broker between both sides and supplant Soviet influence. So it's a good example of strategy and also a matter of timing of how you implement that strategy. He, uh, Dr. Kissinger comes up with a nice formulation in these interviews that he repeats a couple of times to tell the Arabs that they may win the war through Soviet arms, but they, to win the peace they need American diplomacy. Exactly. That sums it up. Yeah. We have time for one last question. 
It's a pleasure being here. It's the first time I want to share. I'm actually a Republican, finally, as of yesterday. I changed parties, so I'm practicing. My, um, my question is, um, from my knowledge or experience, we never really understood, or I haven't understood, what was Kissinger's opinion of what, what happened in the Watergate and how Nixon handled it? Because from my opinion, I, he should have just said, yes, I did, and that would have been the end of it. Instead, he kind of covered it up or tried right. to cover it up. So in your opinion, I don't what? recall Kissinger making any comments or what his thoughts were on how he handled it. Well, I, I don't want to speak for him, but I think he would subscribe to the conventional wisdom that many subscribe to, including me, that the initial sin of breaking in and looking for research on the opposition carried out originally without Nixon's knowledge. If he had just said, I didn't authorize this, this was a mistake, it won't happen again, second term, all the lost opportunities were talked, that's why it's so sad. But then he did go to, I have to be honest, as a great admirer of his, he went to unacceptable lengths to cover it up, including criminal acts, and he paid for it, as I said earlier, and he, and he deserved to pay for it. It's a real shame. So what Kissinger would think, uh, obviously he felt incredible lost opportunity for the country uh, in terms of a second term in foreign policy, a personal tragedy for a man he greatly respected, uh, but I'm sure he would feel that it was a terrible tactical mistake, and it was born out of many experts on Nixon here, much more than I am, so I don't want to go too far afield here, but he did have suspicions of certain enemies, and even, as somebody said, even a paranoid has enemies, so he did have some real enemies who were unfair, but it carried him too far, and it's, it's, a, it's a real shame that, uh, that it happened. Uh, so it would be interesting to see to whether Kissinger addresses this more directly in his next, next portrait. Let me say, since we're closing here, I want to thank Jonathan for what he did to help get this book done and arranging this evening. And Frank, you've obviously taken great care in putting this together as well as the clip. So uh, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Dr. Gannon, Ambassador, thank you so much. Uh, Ambassador will, will be available in, in the museum in the Annenberg Court, and Dr. And Kissinger on Kissinger is available in the museum store for purchase. Thank you all for coming, and please check back for future events at nixonfoundation.org. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay, I'll see you. Okay.